just a few minutes ago, um, we had the opportunity to hear from Torah this very difficult story of the binding of Isaac. And I'm not going to take time to read through all of it. Likely, it is a familiar story to you. But if you wanted to peek at it and review in the book, it was on pages 240 and 241. It is traditional on this second day of Rosh Hashanah to chant this story from the scroll. And in some communities where they only observe one day in the reform movement, typically this is the story, and not the one we read yesterday, but this is the story, the binding of Isaac, that's chanted on that single day of Rosh Hashanah. And in at least some ways, in some estimations, this is a bit of a baffling choice for this holiest of days, a celebration of the new year. And it certainly presents us with difficulty. Many traditional explanations and commentaries say that this story is meant to display Abraham's incredible faith, his great faith that he would obey God's command without question, even a seemingly incomprehensible command to sacrifice his beloved son Isaac for whom he waited until he was older than a hundred years old, and Sarah was over 90. Finally, they have a son, and this is the command. It raises so very many questions that I think we could fill more than just this study slam with just naming those questions. But just to name a few, the big one, how could God ask this? of Abraham. How could God ask this? What must this mean about God if God is asking Abraham to do this? Why did Abraham not push back or question at all? Why does Abraham, at least in the Torah text, say nothing? Rush, get up early in the morning, ready to roll, rush to do this task. Why do we not see in a day journey, a three-day journey to the mountain with Isaac, with a servant, when presumably Abraham might have had a chance to think a little bit? Why do we not see or hear about any even internal struggle? We have a cryptic conversation between Abraham and Isaac, but that's it. Why, when Abraham argued with God speaking truth to power when God wanted to wipe out Sodom and Gomorrah, why did Abraham push back and hear? He rushes to do this. What about the innocent here? I could keep going on and on, clearly, right? But the other one I want to name is, what about Sarah? What about Sarah? Where is her voice in all of this? And while realistically it's not uncommon for voices other than men to be found, at least in full conversation, in our text, in our Torah text, where is Sarah? What possibly could she have been experiencing through this ordeal? What possibly might have been her reaction if she didn't know in advance what was going to happen when she found out? So we have a chance to dig in to at least some of these questions today. There will certainly be many questions left unanswered. I've studied and studied this portion. We have studied and studied this portion. And there's still so many difficult issues and unanswered questions. So I want to invite you to look in your handout, beginning on page two. Beginning on page two. And let's take a look at this text from Bereshit Rabbah together. This text I love because it imagines a little bit of Abraham's reaction and gives voice to what maybe we might have hoped a little more of from Abraham. God said, take your son, and on and on. God said, take, I beg you, please, your son. Which son? I have two sons. God said, your only son. 
This, this one is the only one of his mother, and this one is the only one of his mother, right? I have Ishmael, I have Isaac, right? Which one do we mean? And God responds, the one you love. And Abraham replies, is there a limit to the affections? How could there be a limit? I love both of them, right? It's Chak, Isaac. And why did God not reveal it to him without delay in order to make Yitzchak even more beloved in his eyes and reward him for each and every word spoken? And then we have a textual comparison, right? So we have Abraham saying, wait a second, which son? What son? I love both of them. How could you, right? A little, maybe I'm imagining, but a little incredulity maybe. But one thing I love about this text and the fact that there are so many midrashim, so many commentaries, is that this means the rabbis of old, this midrash, Bereshit Rabbah, this is a classical midrash, from around the same time period as the Talmud, 400 or so of the common era. This means the rabbis of old struggled with this too. They wouldn't create midrashim unless there were questions springing forth from the text for them. Another text that I love that references or, or brings in this feeling of love and affection that I want to see from Abraham struggling with this is on page three, and it's what I think of as a modern midrash from the poet Yehuda Amichai. So we're not going to read each of the texts. Don't worry. Everyone's looking at their clock. There are a lot of texts on this text sheet. We're not going to read all of them. We are going to read this one because I love it too much. Three sons had Abraham, not just two. Three sons had Abraham, Yishmael, Yitzchak, and Yifke. First came Yishmael, God will hear. Next came Yitzchak, he will laugh. And the last was Yifke, he will cry. No one ever heard of Yifke, for he was the youngest, the son that father loved best, the son who was offered up on Mount Moriah. Yishmael was saved by his mother, Hagar. Yitzchak was saved by the angel, but Yifka, nobody saved. When he was just a little boy, his father would call him tenderly, Yifki, Yifkala, my sweet little Yifki, but he sacrificed him all the same. The Torah says the ram, but it was Yifka. Yishmael never heard from God again. Yitzchak never laughed again. Sarah laughed only once, then laughed no more. Three sons had Abraham, Yishma will hear, Yitzchak will laugh, Yivke will cry, Yishmael, Yitzchakel, Yivkeel. God will hear, God will laugh, God will cry. Right, so it captures the sense of love. It's radical, a whole other child, right? And do you hear in there, reminiscent of the Kaddish prayer? That rhythm, right? Yishmael, Yitzchakel, Yifkael, right? The next poem, I'll just call your attention to it, is from Yiddish originally, but it also contains a little bit of hesitation with the refrain, and waits, and waits, and waits. And really, I think, reimagines Abraham as knowing God will interrupt this at some point, and taking his time with this terrible act to give God time to interrupt. It's the hesitance that perhaps I really want to read into Abraham, rather than this zirizut, this enthusiastic get up and go of rushing to this task. All right, so one more note before I turn over to Rabbi Capel, and that is Sarah, right? We asked the question of Sarah. What might have been going on with her? So I'm just going to raise the questions, and we're going to kick. This is the slam part where you're going to kick it over. Um, 
Sarah's voice is so absent from this text. And I want to point us on page four to another classical midrash in the middle of the page. Um, midrash Tanhuma, right, so classical midrash. Um, and this midrash imagines Satan, meaning the angel of God in Jewish tradition, the mischievous angel trying to stir things up at every occasion, the divine prosecutor in certain tellings, um, deciding that he's going to let Sarah know a little bit of what's happening. And he comes in the form of Isaac, right? Satan disguises himself as Isaac. Um, and Sarah asks, what did your father do to you, my son? And he replies, my father led me over mountains and through valleys until we reached finally the top of a certain mountain. And he erected an altar, arranged firewood, bound me on the altar, and took the knife to slaughter me. And if the angel hadn't interrupted, I would have been slaughtered, right? And he hardly completed reading what had transpired when her soul leapt from her body. And she passed, right? And this is the Midrash's way of answering not only, not only what on earth must Sarah have been doing here, but also why in the next Torah portion, after this one, the next thing we hear about Sarah is that she died. They imagine her dying from shock and her soul leaping from her body. Right, this doesn't answer any of the moral questions about the text that the next commentary points us to, but it does begin to answer at least a little bit about what Sarah's experience must have been. And the last thing I'll say before I um, turn things over to Rabbi Capel is just a little bit about my personal sense of finding meaning in this text. And that is, while well, it's multi-layered, one layer is it is okay to encounter texts in Torah, find them difficult, and let them be difficult, right? Sometimes a text is too traumatic too horrible to say, what's the silver lining of this text? What's the lovely meaning? It's horrible. It's terrible. It's disturbing, and it's meant to be disturbing. I really believe it's not as if parents love children any less way back when compared to today. It's horrible, right? So I want to say, if that's where you are with this text, that's fine. You can be there. You can say, I'm not going to get a lovely, frilly, bunnies and butterflies meaning from this. One meaning after this year's struggle that I'm drawing out of this text is thinking about Abraham in relation to Sodom and Gomorrah and Abraham's actions here. And my reaction is, if this is a test, I envision this as a test of not only being able to have single-minded focus on our goal, single-minded focus on what we believe is right, but also on our relationships and on our family and on our expressions of love and care of those we are in relationship with, family, friends, community. And if we are not considering family, friends, community, our love in our actions, then we are failing the test. So this year as I encounter this, I believe Abraham failed this test, hands down. And I also believe that by and large, we already take that lesson in hand. We already prioritize our relationships, and I'll invite each of us to lean in even more to considering relationships and care when we are tested in our own lives, and we are tested, thank God, not in this way, in our own lives. So that's my meaning that I'm drawing this year as well. Thank you so much, Yashikoa. So I want to take us back to the very first verse of this reading, and God said, Avraham, and Avraham said, Hineni, here I am. It's a theme. When Isaac calls on his father to question what the heck is going on, Abraham again answers, Hineni. 
And he offers the same reply a third time when the angel cries out to him. He nani. Abraham in this story is nothing if not present and accounted for. And I thought about this theme a lot as I had occasion just a week ago to stand at the grave of Rabbi Albert Plotkin, Zichrono Livracha, may his memory be for blessing. Rabbi Plotkin came to Arizona in 1955 and served the Jewish community of Phoenix for more than 40 years. And during that time, he was a pioneer in the civil rights movement, so much so that he received the NCCJ National Award of Brotherhood. I owe my career to Rabbi Plotkin. When Temple Beth Shalom in Mesa was seeking a new rabbi in 1987, it was he who whispered in their ear that they ought to consider a woman rabbi, a novelty back in those days. And here I am, Hineni. <laughs> I was surprised to see this one word on his headstone. It was the essence of who he was. Jews have proudly been leaders in movements for social justice as Rabbi Plotkin was in his generation. As Rabbi Siegel said, we imagine Rabbi, uh, we imagine Abraham in those footsteps of Rabbi Plotkin as a champion of justice when God shares with him the imminent destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, Abraham launches into a fierce argument, culminating in his unforgettable cry, shall not the judge of all the earth do justly. So it remains a mystery as to why Abraham is so ready to sacrifice his beloved son without questioning. Even in the United States Army, which is a notorious yes sir, yes ma'am culture, it is counter to the uniform code of military justice to obey an illegal order. We are obligated to just say no when that is the appropriate response. The Danish philosopher Soren Kierkegaard, in addressing this story of Abraham, writes of what he calls a teleological suspension of the ethical by which he means that sometimes blind obedience to what appears to be the right thing to do is actually not okay. Sometimes righteousness requires action beyond the letter of the law. The ethical is suspended in his words. Jacob Gladstein, an early 20th century poet, ascribes the Hineni to Isaac himself reflecting a kind of a Holocaust motif in the Yiddish translation by Edda Blum, which you can find on page six in your handout at the bottom of the page. He depicts Isaac as well aware of his fate, calling out in a tired voice, here I am prepared to be your ram. We understand these words and the futility of resistance in that historical moment of the Holocaust experience while vowing not to remain passive, not to remain silent in the face of wrongdoing. Aliza Shenhar's poem, The Akedah, translated by Linda Zisquit on the same page, conveys a sense of anger imagining a scene where the angel fails to intervene. The white angel, the one who always cries, please don't lay a hand, is on leave. Her poem invites us to consider what if there had been no angel to intervene? And she concludes with the haunting thought that 
leaving us to question our reliance on angels to protect us in the final moment. Maybe there is no angel. Maybe we need to be the angels to intervene. In the contemporary Midrash, Bila Krista Ariha brings Sarah into the conversation again. Sarah requesting that she be the one to be tested while her son is spared. The author describes the two voices in conflict. One, Hineni, willing to follow the order without question, and the other, Hineni, setting an example of self-sacrifice that will resound through the generations. She can't imagine that Abraham proceeded without question. It is unfathomable. And so she concludes, and the two of them walk together, something else. Don't read, and Abraham saddled, vayachavosh his donkey, chamoro, but rather he overcame vayichvosh his mercies, rachamav. For Abraham was holding back his tears as he went, but they broke through his eyes and ascended all the way to the creator of the universe and said before God, look at your servant Abraham, see his lowliness before you. See that he isn't begging for mercy for himself and his son like he did for Sodom because of his trust in you. Please revoke your decree. Ari ha emphasizes that we cannot not intervene in the face of evil. In relating the story of the Akedah, Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, another pioneer in our civil rights movement, commented that the angel appeared at the very last minute to stay Abraham's hand. And a student asked Rabbi Heschel, what would have happened if that angel had come a second too late? And Heschel's answer to that student was, an angel cannot come too late, but we humans made of flesh and blood, we may come too late. Heschel was a role model in his advocacy for tikkun olam, repairing the world. And his commentary reminds us of the importance of acting now in both our personal lives and in our world. We can be too late. And there's nothing more painful than regret, than spending our lives wondering what if we had made a better choice. Abraham's family is shattered by the choice he made to move forward without question. Sarah dies, and he and Isaac never speak again. Yes, we need to say hineni, but our hineni is not about accepting transparent wrong. The Torah describes Abraham's encounter with God as a test. Tests are a part of life. We are tested every day. The high holidays are about looking at the choices that we have made with a critical eye, knowing that we are all human and we all fail at times. We are tested in our business ethics, in our response to tragedy, in our interactions with family. When we are hurt, our forgiveness is tested. When we are blessed, our generosity is tested. The test we face may not be as dramatic as that of Abraham. The story of the Akedah to me is an invitation to consider how we have been tested in the year which is drawing to a close when have we replied with a resounding hineni, and when have we not been as present as we had wished we had been? Are there times we were conspicuous in our absence? Martin Luther King Jr. reminded us that in the end, we will remember not the words of our enemies, 
but the silence of our friends. We need to be there to face the challenge of injustice. We need to say hineni. May we demonstrate the courage of our convicted, convictions, acting with boldness and passion in the year ahead. Hineni.